sit okay hi everyone this is elsa and uh, you know this is a special episode of amazing grace which we have put together because we, i'm trying to take advantage of having uh, my guest here she's at yale only for a few days so i thought why not have it out of schedule so amazing grace is a facebook live series that i'm having with contemporary women leaders who are doing extraordinary things uh as part of the many networks that i'm part of i have wonderful wonderful women friends and i'm always inspired and motivated by them and i thought why not bring these stories to you so that you get to know these wonderful women as well as they can serve as role models to the young girls out there who are struggling to figure out what can they do with their lives uh the journey is never easy but as we see from these amazing uh life uh, conversations um you know they are very interesting journeys so today with me is uh, the 2017 world fellow rita shara she is Hello. Uh yeah hi good morning hi, good morning <laughs> she is the strategic advisor to the UNDP head in Mexico yes. did i get it right yes okay so rita welcome and uh, can you share with us who you are because you're okay. such a wonderful woman and please feel comfortable <laughs> sit thank down. you yeah so first of all thank you so much elsa for uh, this opportunity to talk I imagine mostly with the indian people i am rita shara i am italian i was yellow world fellow last year i have been working for the last 13 years with undp in dominica republic haiti and now in mexico i am from the south of italy um and this is a very special place to come from because uh, i think we have more challenges coming from the south um and that's it basically who i am a civil servant very passionate about her job and uh, very very happy to at last year the opportunity to 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 be a year old fellow living with wonderful people like you this experience here in yale thank you and from what i know about italy i think if there's one nationality that's closest to indians it's, it's italian. italian so yeah. <laughs> yeah i'm very happy to have you here with me thank you so tell us a little bit uh, no Tell us three adjectives that describe you. Yeah, I think I'm ve- I'm a very curious person. I'm very passionate, and I think I am full of energy. Uh-huh. Yeah, we can see that. <laughs> so curious, full of energy, and very passionate. Yeah, yeah. I think that describes <laughs> you. So, you know, I was looking at your bio, and briefly yesterday you mentioned that you actually lived in India for yes. what three years? For, no, three months. Three months. It was a short stay, but um, very intense. Okay, so tell us about it. Well, back in 2001, I was an intern working for uh, the Italian in- uh, the Italian consulate in Mumbai, in Kanchanjunga Road. So I can say, so I have the proof <laughs> I have been there, and I was responsible for uh, the um, for the cultural events. So it was 15 years, 50 years of uh, the Italian fashion. Uh, the, there was this fashion show. So I was there to organize a fashion show, a fashion exhibition and um a cinema festival wow. about Italy. So we did the same in Mumbai and in New Delhi. Wow, that sounds like a an amazing, amazing job. experience. Yeah. <laughs> I really enjoyed it a lot. So did you meet a lot of Bollywood stars? I met some. I met some Bollywood for, for, for me was crazy. I remember staying in um in the Oberoi hotel and see all these movies from my balcony and uh, th- this was great like i think i i think india is a great country i enjoyed so much the food there the people the culture this opposite that stay together in the same country the diversity and i felt home and this is the reality i also know that rita is an indian name yes it is so, <laughs> so there were many things that uh, um were amazing about india and i really enjoyed to be there for three months i was very young <laughs> I think I I had this great opportunity. So you should come back. I will. I yeah. will. It's a promise. And um tell us a little bit about your current job at UNDP. What have you been doing? Um since February, uh I'm working in uh, UNDP Mexico and uh, I went there especially to support a recovery project after uh, uh, the earthquake of September. And uh, UNDP has a special mandate when there is uh, um, an emergency. after the humanitarian uh, reform each agency has a special mandate and our mandate is about early recovery 
which means create this uh, uh, bridge between emergency and development, doing special actions to bridge this new, these two moments. So we look at the emergency with a long-term vision, and maybe later I'm going to explain better what, what this means. So I was there to support the project of early recovery, but then we got a fund on private sector. Mm -hmm. So as UNDP, we're trying to find new way to fund the achievement of the Agenda 2030, and one of these is the involvement of private sector. Absolutely. I don't see how the 2030 goals can be achieved without, without the involvement them. of the private sector. So we're trying to create a new uh, pilot projects with the private sector in Mexico, which is huge, which is flourishing. And uh, we're trying to launch different initiatives on the recuperation of uh, cultural heritage. And uh, what we would like also to do is working with the renewable energy in order to create local development in very poor zones. So that's what I'm, I'm doing. I'm like advising the country office on these topics. Okay. And uh, you know, earlier this week, you spoke at a panel at Yale on uh, blue innovation, yeah. that is the innovation in the UN. And we had a lot of requests on my Facebook timeline to say, can you please stream live? But we mm. couldn't, it yeah. was a closed door session. But can you tell us a little bit, because you, sh you shared a lot of examples of innovation that the UN does in mm. these areas, especially when you were in Haiti. Yeah, so um, I think, I mean, we're facing um, a lot of challenges. The world is a new world we didn't know before. I mean, we have a number of migrations that we didn't know before. We have um, a world that is growing in population. We have still many challenges as women, like there are more than 90 countries that have economic barrier to have economic inclusion for women. And we have technology, right? Mm -hmm. And this world is in a, con a constant change. And as UN, of course, we are giving answer to this new world. So like the new administrator, Akim Steiner, had just launched um, this new innovation facility. But I think that we have been innovating uh, for many years. And uh, an uh, uh, example I was giving was about my experience in Haiti when I, when I was working on debris removal. So what we have done is that we, there was like um, 10 million cubic meter of debris, and this is a line of debris from Canada to Argentina, a, a line of trucks, just to give you an idea. And as you- One minute. Say that again, a, a uh, debris equals the, the, the line yeah, of the trucks yeah. from Canada to, to Argentina. Argentina. This is the problem oh. we, we faced in Haiti. So as UNDP, um, building this bridge between emergency and, uh, and development, what we were doing is that we were um, involving the community to clean this debris, what we call cash for work. So we, ca we pay the people to start to clean the debris and instead of wasting the, this debris, we were transforming them in paving stones. So with the same debris that many people consider a waste, we were transforming them in paving stone to start to rebuild the neighborhoods, mm -hmm. the neighborhoods that were totally destroyed. And we have done this involving 40% of women. So nobody could believe that a, we or that a woman could like carry the debris could be a good uh, uh, team leader of uh, small teams of 20 people, but they did it. And as all of you know, like one dollar invested in a woman is a, a dollar invested in education, in health, in kids that are going to, to raise um, and be educated at school. So it's a real investment for development, no? Yeah. One dollar invested in a woman goes a long way. It yeah you know, impacts education, health, the well-being of a family, and so much more. Absolutely. So this was a big innovation, no? because we were able to clean the debris, to recycle the debris, to rebuild the neighborhoods, and then with the community leaders, once we had the uh, risk maps, understanding when the, the risk was higher, we were starting to rebuild the, 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 the neighborhoods with, with the people, and uh, we were supporting uh, uh, enterprises with women, we were supporting at local level all this action with the community, but then we were also supporting the government by doing public policies like the small medium enterprise public policy or a public policy on debris management. Also, as UNDP to create this bridge, we have this double approach, top down and bottom up. 
And by doing this, we think that we believe that we create this path towards development now, to have people that are more prepared, to have this path that can help people to be resilient and to be back to a better life. And one of the things that came up in that panel that you spoke at, and uh, at least what I took away from that panel was the involvement of the community. You don't create all these projects and solutions no. without involving the community. Yeah. And one of the examples you gave, which uh, stood out, was about the women saying, can you give us, uh, uh, they negotiated for their wage, right? Yeah. So can you share that story? Yeah, so um, in UNDP Latin America, uh, we have uh, um, a special project that is a support to women uh, when they have uh, uh, ent micro enterprises, no, and after um, like a big tragedy, you lo you lose everything. Mm -hmm. This project is called Anale in Creole, which means uh, let's go and march in uh, in uh, in uh, in Spanish. So basically, what what we do is that we train women in uh, accountability, marketing, and uh, management, and there is also a, a, an important component of self esteem, mm -hmm. no. Because this part, especially for women, there is a lot of violence. We saw that this, it's a, an important component. And then we give back the livelihoods and tools that they need to restart the enterprise. And now this is, enterprise is much better, right? Because they have been trained. So we, did in, we started in Mexico and we did this project by phase. So we did the first 200, so support to 200 women, then to other 200 women, and then we did an evaluation. And when we did the evaluation, we started to talk with these women to say, you know, in focus group, what do you think? It was helpful. And they were giving us the best insight to improve this project. And I remember the, 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 the one of the advice they gave us was, you are helping me, but once the project is over, if I don't have any other support, mm -hmm. I feel more frustrated because mm -hmm. now I'm trained, I mm -hmm. have my tools, but then I don't have your support anymore. Mm. So they gave a lot of advice that we applied to the project to improve in it. And this was like, help us to formalize mm. my enterprise. Mm. Otherwise you will leave me always in a situation of mm. informality. Great. Mm. They told us, don't give us the tool. Mm. Give us a mechanism after the formalization where we can go to the banks and ask for loans and support. And this was like when we did the replication, the creation of a revolving fund for women. No? Mm -hmm. And uh, these were all inside that allowed us with the, 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 the involvement of, of the women, like to do, for example, another training where a part of self-esteem was given by the women that were already trained. Okay. So all these... So it's a very sustainable process. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's a project that we, we have done in Haiti, we have replicated in Ecuador after uh, the earthquake, uh, we have replicated in Mexico after the working, and it's a project that works very well in a context like Latin America, especially after a disaster in order to restart their life and their business now. Mm -hmm. Always with this idea in mind that a dollar invested in a woman yeah. in a is a dollar. I think we should all put it on our fridges to remind us every day a dollar invested in a woman is a dollar that goes really far. It's true. I mean, there are studies, there are researchers, there, there are paper, also with remittances now. When yeah. the remittances arrive to a woman in a country, they are invested in education, in health, in development now. So when you were 18, did you think you would be doing all these fantastic things? Um, as I told you before, I came from the south of Italy and I went to Milan to study, to study public uh, administration. But then thanks to a very good friend of mine, uh, I attended a course on international development and I opened this book of the Nobel Prize, Indian Nobel Prize, Amartya Sen, Development as Freedom. Okay. And I remember there was this sentence in one of the chapters saying, no matter where you are from, you should be the same access to opportunity in order to be free, to choose what you want to do in life. And if I thought about my life, or about all the young people like me that needed to leave the south of Italy to look for other opportunity, the Nobel Prize was telling a little bit about my story and about the story of all my very good friends who are now working in the north, unfortunately. You know? I say, wow, who is this guy? Then I started to, 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 to study a lot about human development. And at a certain point, I found out that UNDP, 
was the agency of the United Nations whose core was human development. And I said, no, I want to work. I want to work for this agency. And since I was 21, I started to apply to, to, to any single vacancies. And um, I was lucky enough when I was 25 to, to be selected uh, as a UN volunteer in Santo Domingo. And there it's a Middle Indian country. The country office was working directly with the government in order to draft public policy with a massive program on social protection. And there I, I was so happy to touch with my hands the fact that with a public policy, you can give opportunity to the people and maybe give the opportunity to people to be more free. So what Amartya Sen was saying, I was actually doing in Dominican Republic for the first time within UNDP. And I was very proud, I am very proud. I think that uh, in all the country offices, we do a wonderful job and I could witness this in Dominican Republic, Haiti, and now in Mexico. That's great. And Amartya Sen is Indian as well. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I wanted to say, tell everyone that my last guest was Elpida Ruka, who's also from the UN, who yes. was on the panel with you. And the UN recently celebrated its 73rd anniversary. And whilst we all criticize the UN, uh, you know, for many things, there are uh, great uh, officials like you and LP who are you. putting your lives on the line to do the right thing. So thank you for the work thank you Thank you, Elsa. And what makes you wake up every day? Why do you do what you do? Um, I think that this part of leaving the world a little bit better, it's a fundamental part of being happy of what you do. And when you have a team of people very enthusiastic about this so with the same vision and I have beautiful colleagues working everywhere, believing in this uh, and it's for real. I mean, you have seen Alpida uh, in countries like Iraq, like Syria, like Haiti, uh, Central African Republic. I mean, there is, a, I said the other day, there, there is a, u a, a huge part of personal choice, no? It's not easy and it's very easy to blame on the UN, but then UN is an organization made of human beings that really believe in this. So I think that this part of, uh, it's a little bit also, no, that the mission of the, the Yale World Fell, you know? We are all here because we believe that as individual, but as a group, we could have a change in this world so challenging right now, no? So I think that this is the part that moved me with, with the hope that one day I can do something more for the south of Italy, mm -hmm. going back to my region and uh, help all those young people that think that the only hope they have is leaving our region in the south, going to the north or going to a, a, other countries. Yeah, I'm getting goosebumps listening to you, but uh, I wanted to ask you, you're actually my first 2017 World mm -hmm. Fellow. What, did, what was the experience like for you to be a Yale World Fellow, both on campus and now that you've spent one year away and after finishing the course? We always say you're fellow once, you're fellow forever, no? I think that you cannot actually describe what the program is until you don't leave it. Um, for me, it was a before and a after in my life. After so many years uh, just dedicated to, to, to my work, it was a moment where I could prioritize my life uh, again and set up again the priorities. It was an amazing experience because in our daily job, you don't have opportunity to listen to people talking about uh, community involvement. Yes, I do, but if you're, uh, like if you're an artist, maybe you're not. Or about interreligion dialogue, or about how to create a social enterprise in Argentina, or how to run a think tank on the food system in, in Mexico. No? This was, it's like uh, your eyes, you are, you, you are thirsty because you want to drink all this water coming from all these different oceans, and it's unbelievable. That's Emilia because it's a deep trip within yourself and through all the people coming from different countries with different backgrounds, telling the story. And, and I still remember there are some discussion when you say, wow, hmm. no, I could not believe that this person has such a background or such a story life and he or she did so much for their community, for the country, many times putting their life at risk uh, and this is fantastic because it's four months 
where you can think about the world, what you can do, which is your added value as an individual, as a group. And this is simply fantastic because then will people will be your best buddies for the rest <laughs> of your life. And uh, it's a unique opportunity. And I was, I consider myself extremely lucky to, to be one of the fellows of the 2017. I'm so grateful myself to be part of the Yale World Fellow community. Um, for those watching out there uh, and who want to join the UN, uh, what is your advice to them? How can they join? How can they get involved? How can they be part of uh, this change that is happening in Central America or mm. elsewhere in the world? I will give you the advice that uh, a former US staff gave to me when I was 21. He told me, start with an internship, write to people, ask to do a first experience on the field, just to understand what we do and how we do it. And to understand if this kind of life can be good for you, no? Because uh, you go in a country, then you have to live after four, four, four years, three years, five years. So start always with an internship. And if you can do uh, one, two, it would be fantastic. Um, everybody tell us, yes, but it's for free and there is this spot. Yes, it's true. But work during the summer and then you do the... In I think that when you really believe in something or try to find a fellowship no that's like people like me did it because we really believe it and want it i'm not alone there is a, like <laughs> a huge crew of people like me so just start with an internship if you can and try to the people try to reach the people write uh, an email just propose what you can do because i really believe in young people when i was in haiti i had a wonderful group of young people working 15 16 hours and as a team, we could do amazing things because when you are very young, you have this passion, you believe in the mission, you want to change the world. And this is something which is, I mean, is a, an invaluable price. And I, I really believe that young people are the ones who with this passion can change the world and they do. So what's your advice to the young girls out there? Young girls, wow. Tells you what, I'm going to tell you what my first boss told me in Dominican Republic. And it's, we have a lot of job to do. I mean, since we won so many rights, there is such a long way to go. And we have to continue to fight and to sustain each other. There is this concept in, uh, in Spanish which, which is sonoridad, which is sisterhood. Mm -hmm. And I really believe in this. Mm -hmm. When you see, uh, a buddy, a girl, a friend of you that is in need, we have to support each other. Because if we don't do this, few people will do this for us. No? Absolutely. So uh, the fight is there. We have to fight on all the levels that we can, showing that we can do it all, even if, like my current boss say, maybe not everything at the same time. <laughs> no? Because One it's true. Time. One step at a time. But this fact of supporting each other, this sense of sisterhood, it's fundamental to go on and be united in this fight. Because, wow, if you think that there are the only country we have nowadays that has a law to have equal salary is Ireland, mm. the only country in the world. Yes. So we have a, a lot of job to do. Yes. We have a lot of work to do. Yes. And on that note, I would like to thank my guest, Rita thank Shara, you, for joining us and sharing some of her time with thank us you. and her experiences and wish you all the very best. Thank you, Elsa. I thank you to all of you for listening. And if you have any comments or thoughts, just put it in the comments section. Rita is already tagged and whenever she has the time, she will respond. With pleasure. Okay. Take care. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.